So I've just arrived at 64 Audio and we are here with... Philip. Yeah, I'm the marketing manager here and I work with some of our artists, kind of continue to support the like large scale touring artists and things like that. Uh, I started 64 Audio, which uh, back then it was called 1964 Ears. And uh, yeah, we're about to celebrate our 13th year anniversary. Oh wow, so you guys have a universal and a custom. Yeah. Separate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here, let's go to one of the assemblers over here. Okay. I do have a special place for IEMs just because back in 2003 or four, I bought my very first set. And I remember that feeling of just being so mesmerized by what's inside these little gummy things. They, they, they were silicone. I remember the first thing I wanted to do was cut them open and figure out how, how are these little silver boxes producing sound, you know? I used to take my mom's watches apart when I was a kid because I was so fascinated by all the little gears and mm -hmm. mechanisms. I could never put them back together, but I'm a sucker for small things. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Ooh, here, look at this. Impressive. Oh, these are the cutouts. Yeah. Yeah, oh, so they okay, actually awesome. cut it out on the laser. And yeah, it's all real wood. This is the mother of pearl made of real, real abalone. You kind of see there, like they essentially scan the underside of the assembled IEM so they get the shape, the actual custom shape of the person's ear. Oh. And then they're able to use the artwork that people upload mm -hmm. through the designer. There are certain people's ears that if the internal air volume is way off of normal, it'll actually uh, destructively affect the That's low frequency response. That's what happened response. to Kryn, I heard. Oh, yeah. Because his yeah. ears are, he's got like yeah. massive ears. How is it possible that you guys are able to offer the, the CIMs at the same price as the Universals? So are you asking why are CIMs not more expensive? Exactly. Uh, it comes down to part costs. Uh, I'll give you one example. You know, to print a shell is a lot less expensive to have it machined out of aluminum, have it, oh, you know, post-process, right. have it anodized, all that stuff. I'm Scott, um, and I'm the, the lead assembler. What we do in assembly is we take the, uh, the drivers, the driver sets, and we put them in the actual shells, and we are constantly testing and retesting. Oh, so this is where you guys do the channel matching and stuff yeah, too. Yeah. So you guys are sort of involved with like the fine tuning once the components come by. Yeah, we're kind of in the middle of the system. I, I see. You know, when you're doing assembly of universals, you have to take a lot more caution not to nick the shell because mm. you can't just rep uh, repair it easily. Right. You know, once you nick it, you literally have to get a whole new shell. Uh, so stuff like that. So it, it sort of balances out. This right here is the, the cleanest room. So this is our 3D printing room. They, they get the files from the 3D detailers, okay. which are over here. It starts with the impression material. So she has a set of impressions down there. They first physically detail the impressions. They get it ready to be scanned. That's kind of the, the patented part of the process is being able to place features inside of the shell mm -hmm. that allow us to maximize for space. It's like similar to getting a feel for detailing the physical impressions, but you have to do it kind of in the, the digital, digital space. Yeah. yeah. Wait, so what is this for? I think that they just use it for training. It blown up. Oh, This is okay. not for a person. Gotcha. <laughs> and and the, the other part that I like about it that they're similarly priced is that a person's not going to be making a decision based on money and just go like, what do I really want? Mm -hmm. You know, do I want to maybe sell this later on or let my friend listen to it? And so it steers them in the direction right. based on what they actually need. What would you say, if you can say, is like the breakdown in sales between like, people who purchase CIMs versus UIMs? I would say it's about 60-40, 60, 40, 60 custom, 40% oh, okay. uh, universal. So here at the Universals Lab, we uh, build and uh, create all the new Universals. It's very small and mm -hmm. it takes patience and you know focus, yeah. concentration to get every single one exactly the same, both sides to match exactly what you want it. It starts off with you know these raw components like, um, what shells are these? Those are Neo. Neo, yeah. So. Wow. These are different in that they're not sandblasted like some of the other shells, yeah. So this is a trio, for example. So 
The faceplate snaps onto the shell with some uh, kind of strong adhesive. adhesive, but then there's a chip that goes on top of it, so the Trio one is that kind of machined aluminum look. Oh, this is basically a similar process to the custom IMs. Everything is built here in Vancouver, Washington. Everything from our A2E to 18S and then U4S all the way up to, okay. um, you know, Forte. Do you exclusively use like your own brands in your monitors? For me, for example, I use AirPods all the time just out of convenience. I have some AirPods uh, Pro, I think they're called. Uh, and again, it's just for that convenience. Mm -hmm. But in terms of in-ears, no, I don't use anybody else's in-ears. Uh, okay. uh, I think it would be a crime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there a go-to in your lineup that you like above all else or that you find yourself reaching for more often? You know, it kind of changes because I'm probably using whatever is freshest, becomes steeped in it. I really want to figure out, you know, if it does have any weaknesses and what the strengths are. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess it's it's like spending time with your children, you know? Right. You really want to get to know them. We're at the R&D lab now, and we're going to be meeting Vitaly G. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What I was curious about was like, what your thoughts are on driver count. I'm going to be 100% honest here. Driver count does not matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is the sound. Right. What matters is the performance. Mm -hmm. You could have a single driver IEM that's tuned and built to perfection, and maybe it's worth five grand. When you have one driver, it's much harder to make it do everything and do everything well. When you have more drivers, it can be easier because you have more levers you're pulling right. you know, to tune things. But it can also be harder because it's like, you think it's gonna be great, the curve looks great, you put it in and you're like, wow, that sound stage is really narrow for some reason. Mm -hmm. Swap out one driver for a different driver altogether, different model, right? Boom, all of a sudden your sound stage is wider. Why is it better? Sometimes you don't know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't know. Part of tuning is uh, trial and error. Part of it is theory. So it's, it's like a, a, a combination of science and an art. Sound check is kind of the final one. So mm -hmm. here we're testing an A12T. So they kind of have their parameters, whether it's for frequency response, impedance, distortion, or um, uh, phase. How do you guys choose the sound that you want to get to? How do you guys get through the first phases of tuning? And the first five to 15 seconds of your initial impression, that's what matters. Contrary to what some people say online, certain audio files talk about brain burning. Mm -hmm. Well, my belief is that you don't want brain burning because all you're really doing is telling your brain, this is normal, right. this is how it should sound. And you're adjusting your brain to, to, to be okay with that. We don't believe that, we, we kind of believe the opposite is true. That mm -hmm. first five to 15 seconds of your sound impression is gonna be the most accurate uh, impression of is it natural is it not is exactly it, is it right. correct is it not that you will ever have sometimes our perception varies due to mood health have you been sick are your ears congested that kind of stuff gets really affects it so you can't just always base it off that one initial impression you should um, kind of do it over the course of days or weeks um, so but that's kind of how we start, is we start by listening. I don't know if you know this, but like our hearing can change day to day. Right. You know, barometric pressure or whatever. It's you ate something salty, something sweet, your eardrums or your neurological system actually mm -hmm. responds different to the sound. So you may want something brighter mm -hmm. today and then tomorrow it may be like, no, I want something thicker. That's the, the upside of having all these different models that you can choose from. Generally speaking, there isn't like a lot of studies done on that stuff that I know of. Do you guys do in-house research on stuff like this? Uh, not directly. We did do a little bit of work with a university, a local university here, Washington uh, State University, and they have a program where they're studying this stuff and they actually are studying something really amazing, uh, in my opinion, which is how to regrow uh, cilia inside the cochlea to restore hearing. Oh, wow. They're basically doing stuff with fish where they 
make the fish deaf and then the fish will regrow their cells. Wow. It's pretty amazing. So uh, that's a personal subject of mine because I'm mm -hmm. so conscious of hearing health and for some people it's very dependent uh, on what, what you ate if you had a coffee. Coffee actually dehydrates you so your eardrums aren't as hydrated. So there, there's all kinds of stuff. That is interesting. But that's a, a whole nother sphere, you know. Mm -hmm. No, 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 you guys do your thing. Yeah, this is the kind of last step in the custom in-ear process. They're prepped over here and then they are lacquered over there. You know, the first couple months of the lacquering process was like, oh no, <laughs> why do they look kind of yellow? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an increasingly saturated industry, I feel like, where there are a lot of manufacturers that have one, they've lowered the bar to entry, but two, they've also managed to produce decent sounding IMs at those prices. How is your company sort of approaching that in general? I think it means we need to step up our game. We have been feeling the heat, the pressure of what we call chi-fi. I think that 64 Audio still has something that maybe others don't have. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, um, you know, it's the way we perceive sound and product and everything. I guess our strategy is to lower the price point to some of our products, but also we, we see a lot of demand for higher end product too. Right. So, you know, we're, I guess we're gonna stretch the rubber band a little bit. We're gonna go higher and lower. And would you say that you have like a general idea of what the price point is going to be going in, what drivers you're going to be using? Usually that's decided more so upfront. Then some things get changed and tweaked, but usually more often than not, we have at least a rough idea mm -hmm. on the front end of, of the development. Yeah, so I've noticed that there's like a lot of time between your releases, and I think that's very different from the, the rest of the audiophile industry. When there's a new product release, what problem are we trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Just generate more income, more revenue? If that's what it is, then why are we doing this? There's no passion in that. To put it bluntly, it's because we're trying to make new things that offer new things, whether that be new technology, new or better performance, uh, or a newer, lower price point for something that was available before. What are your thoughts on the brand expanding into other avenues like gaming? So I, I don't see us really, you know, getting into the gaming industry as, as we are in the pro audio industry because it's just not a passion of mine. Right. Um, but having said that, I do think that we have some of the best products for gamers because of the, you know, the quality and the level of detail and the realism that they present. So I could see how gamers would yeah. really enjoy our product. So going back to the headphones thing, do you guys have any plans to approach that in the future? If I'm gonna get into it, I wanna do it really well, like our in-ears, offering something unique. You know, there's just not enough hours in the day to focus on both in-ears and headphones. Have you guys had ideas of approaching like Bluetooth headphones? Yeah, uh, to be honest with you, we were in development uh, from 2019 to like 2021 or something like that with a custom Bluetooth. Okay. And uh, there were some hangups. We were working with a Ukrainian firm um, that sort of stopped the project. Uh, we had a good plan, and I think it was going to be something really cool and revolutionary. So maybe, maybe we'll pick it up again uh, when we have the resources. But uh, I think it would be a great thing to have, you know, a consumer slash prosumer version of mm -hmm. a Bluetooth um, custom fit. Uh, I am. Has there ever been products that? you maybe have wanted to make, but haven't been able to make just because it might not appeal to what consumers want? We, we have the Forte, it's mm -hmm. a great product, and some people will be able to afford that. We will also have products that cost 500, 600, 700 bucks that quite frankly come close, you know, 90 something percent of the way there, right? The, yeah. You get into diminishing returns. You're paying a thousand, two thousand dollars more for you know, one percent improvement. That's kind of the way it is, and that's right. true with cars. That's true with just about any product there is. Pretty much every product we work on, including the low-end products, we work on that until we feel it's done. Yeah, it just goes in. It's just very plush and like soft, kind of. It kind of melts away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting how you guys make comfort such a big priority and like 
It's cool seeing the steps you guys are taking. And when we first made these, it was an accident. We didn't have the higher shore hardness material. Mm -hmm. We're like, all right, let's do it with 25. And I was like, I don't know, that's way too soft. I put them in and I was like, whoa, <laughs> that feels so nice. Yeah. If you're trying to do granular uh, adjustments and changes, mm -hmm. like let's say there's a peak right. and you want to take that peak down, uh, you could build a notch filter, but you're going to run into the issue of component tolerances. So that capacitor value, that inductor value, uh, having, you know, X percentage of tolerance and variance, just literally out of one batch of parts, you will see enough variance in there that when you pair them up, that notch filter will shift and go above or below the target frequency. Oh. And now you have a weird ripple in your response instead of actually taking out the peak you're trying to take out. Mm -hmm. So using notch filters, electrical notch filters, is very impractical. If you can do the same thing acoustically, then you don't have the same issue. Right. Garrett, could you tell us a little bit about what you do here? Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly just kind of, we have a lot of different unique tools and stuff that we have to use. My job is basically to take all those tools and make more solid versions of them. So this was one of the, one of the first projects I got to work on. So essentially there'd be a shell in there with the new uh, socket on there. And this little actuator would just come in and out and plug that cable in over and over again and count up the number on there so that we could run oh, tests of... I see how many times you can take it out yeah. before it breaks. So, Did you design that then? Yeah, yeah, it's running off of a off of an Arduino. In and out. Just got a cable just plugged into it. That's yeah. sick. It looks like stop motion. It does, right? <laughs> That's what I've noticed. It's like... Yeah. You guys are predominantly focused on the, the pro audio industry, but your products have a lot of appeal for audiophiles as well. Mm -hmm. How do you guys go about like balancing those? Uh, I remember even the meeting that we had where I said to my team, guys, we've got to stop trying to please two different audiences with one product. They have different requirements. Um, it's like the soccer mom and the race car driver. Like you can't make one car that fits both of those requirements. Mm -hmm. You know, anytime we're designing a product, who is it for? Is it for audiophiles or is it for pro audio? Now that's not to say that audiophiles don't take interest in something that we think is good for musicians. You know, we actually had this uh, situation where we designed the 18T for audiophiles. We did not have musicians in mind. Oh, but then we had okay. guys like Bon Jovi yeah. and other people really like it and saying like, can you make this thing go louder? You yeah. know, and we're like, wait a minute, this is an audiophile product, but they just really, and so out of that, the, the A18S was born. A18S was specifically designed for stage, S being stage. Um, That's what it stands for. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> what about the A? I've always been curious about the A and the um, So the, the, the story with A is the reason why... So they used to be V series. Okay, I remember uh, that. And I can't remember if, if I intentionally did V for Vitali <laughs> or for like voice or... Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Um, but, it, but when we did A, there was definitely uh, a reason behind it. We uh, implemented a technology called Adele. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2015. And so we thought, well, let's just call them the A-Series because they have a Dell. Um, now, it worked out really nicely that when we uh, had to transition out of a Dell into Apex. Oh, they both start with A They still. both start with A, I so see. that worked quite nicely. Okay, glad you could clear that up because I've always been very curious about like the, the company's naming conventions. The U is universal. U is for universal. And then the T, mm -hmm. A-18T stands for TIA. Okay. The new product that mm -hmm. should be releasing in the next couple of months. We'll probably show more in some of the kind of release um, mm -hmm. material of how difficult it was to actually assemble this and design it because we had to make so much room. Those are two dynamic drivers connected to each other with that acoustically inert coupling chamber. We got a firm, can we add a driver please, kind of a thing. And we were like, well, we don't have any room in the, in the shell but because um, it was so important to try it, we decided to basically make room and move everything around and change everything up and squeeze in another low driver. But it just never sounded right. Wasn't sure what to do next. So that got me thinking about it a little bit. And um, 
in the speaker world, isobaric setups are, um, I don't know how common they are now, but they used to be common when uh, back in the day, like maybe 80s, 90s, early 2000s maybe. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> but uh, space saving reasons. In an isobaric setup, you're actually coupling the two drivers together. With air. With air, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the Neo S2 versus the Trio, which I have just a beat it with. I feel like the Trio is more sizzly in the sense that there is more space between its peaks, whereas with the Neo S2, it's more, more vibrant, if you will, because there's less space between its individual peaks. Moving downwards, I feel like they both have a decent amount of 3 kHz energy relative to maybe some more conventional models in their lineup, like the 12T, 6T, etc. The Neo S2 definitely does not have that, that dip at 1 kHz that the Trio has, and that, as a consequence, makes the mid-range on the Neo S2 sound a little bit thicker, a little bit warmer. I have a feeling that um, other manufacturers are going to start to do isobaric after we <laughs> release ours. To comment on that, because someone might actually say, well, aren't there already other isobaric IEMs out there? There are that are advertised as isobaric. But they're setup. not actually isobaric. I have yet to find one that is truly a, an actual isobaric setup. Mm. When it comes to the bass, the Trio is definitely more controlled. It has less mid-bass. Um, and this has both, one it has more mid-bass, but it also has significantly more sub-bass, I want to say. I don't, I don't know which one I like more. The Trio is very controlled, very sharp in the attack. And then this is just a little bit more, a little bit more thumpy. So I, I think honestly they're playing in the, the same playing field and it's more a difference of how unique do you want your IM to sound. And personal preference, of course. What does the future hold for our company? And, and I think sound that sounds natural, that sounds like real life, that's our goal. Yep. How do internships work at 64 Audio for any of our like maybe college aged viewers if they're interested in hmm. applying? If someone's really passionate about what we do and they and they would want to somehow be a part of the team and, and do something like an internship, I mean they just have to write us uh, and say, hey, you know, I'm I'm crazy about you know this technology and I just I want to learn more we would be very very selective who, who we would bring on board because it's you're investing into that person right. an intern coming on board would have to add value or at least not slow us down <laughs> you know I had no idea that it was going to turn into this mm -hmm. you know I, I do have a, a documentary that we made so it's really a, a team effort and a team I guess success we're just super passionate about what we do and we want to continue doing it. And I, I hope that our customers really feel that. We're not in this for the money. It's this company was built on passion. And yeah, thanks so much for watching. Like the video, subscribe, all that good stuff. Precog out.